Welcome to REST, which stands for our Resiliency and Empowerment Seminar today. I am your host, Susan Gans, and I am the founder of Gans Strategic Solutions, where we work at the intersection of business and human behavior. This show is about hearing from leaders of small and mid-sized businesses, as well as nonprofits. We talk about the leaders' journeys professionally and hear about their organizations, and most importantly, how they're being resilient and empowering others during these challenging times. Today, I'm so excited to have a friend and colleague of mine who, who the two of us go back, way back, to uh, times where we worked together when I was at Merrill Lynch. So today we have John Federoff, who is the founder and owner of Quick Chow, which is an online order platform for quick service restaurants. Quick Chow provides customized solutions for each restaurant with branded apps and websites so their customers can order meals directly from their restaurant's own site. John founded Quick Chow, which is also formerly known as EDC meals in 2001, so he was one of the first providers of online ordering to restaurants, or as I tell him, he is a man before his time. Quick Chow is 100% owned by John, and here he is 19 years later, still going strong and currently on a very fast growth track. Before starting Quick Chow, John sold commercial paper in Manhattan and earned a BA from Williams College in 1986. Welcome to the show, John. Thank you for having me, Susan. You're welcome. So I've always <laughs> been curious about how you got into the whole executive dining, meals, online ordering. Take us back to earlier in your career. Yeah, so well, sure. Um, so I, you know, I was selling paper in Manhattan, and uh, it was right around when the desktop publishing came into being, the fax machine, and, and I was selling to commercial printers. The business was just being moved to the Midwest. People could fax orders, so the printers were very were struggling. So therefore, the paper industry was was just a tough industry for me to get into at the time. So I was moonlighting, and I had this coupon book I put together with 50 restaurants uh, and uh, you get a buy one, get one free, entree kind of thing. So I went into Merrill Lynch where you used to work and I tried it as a, a blood drive gift. Uh, you, know, you give blood, you get a coupon book. And I did that with a bunch of companies, bulk sales that way. And the woman I met, uh, I think on the fourth floor of the South Tower, she was, she was like, you know, I really have no interest in this, but we do dinners four times a week for people at a shop. And uh, we're sick of using Domino's and Omerandu in the same four restaurants. If you could get me some different restaurants, that would be great. You know, but I'm like, oh, I don't really do that. And then we started talking, like, let me think about that. You know, so in any event, I came back to her a week later with a, a menu book of seven or eight restaurants that agreed to give Merrill Lynch a discount of 10% if they ordered, you know, over the phone, this is back in the 90s before the internet, and uh, and the restaurants agreed to pay me a commission as well. So that's how I started Executive Dining Club, and it was named that way for the coupon book originally. And so then all of a sudden, this, this one woman in this one department was spending $2,000 a week at my restaurants, and that's how the business started. So I started working with different floors at Merrill Lynch, calling the secretaries. Uh, hey, I'm working with Janice on number four. I just want to drop my book by. And I built uh, this business in Merrill Lynch. And then purchasing called me. It was like, you can't do this. You can't just walk through the building and do this. But then they're like, we like what you're doing. Why don't you talk to the investment banking division? Thank <laughs> you. And so this was right around the time the internet. Well, anyway, so we launched with the investment bankers and all everyone was doing phone orders. Come 2001, the internet hit, and we, we morphed that business to, and I built the website edcmeals.com, which was back in our heyday when uh, you and Jim and Maxine and, you know, yeah. uh, and that's how EDC got started on the internet. Uh, and then I morphed it one more time from there, Seamless Web, and there were some other big competitors. I 
wanted to be flexible, and I, I, I was losing ground to them because they were well-financed and I was not. So I decided to start building individual websites for restaurants. And my first website was the Applebee's right down below. I did an, a local Applebee's just for that franchise. And I did Texas Road History. And back then I charged Applebee's like $4,000 for a website. Now we're doing for 150. So it's like <laughs> that started at $60 when I came out. And anyway, and that's how I got my start. That's so exciting. So <laughs> even in your journey, within your journey, you had several reinventions and reincarnations and just opportunities that they came along and you just saw them and it seized them. It's really inspiring. Yeah, yeah, we adapted uh, several times, you know, and uh, exactly, you know. And you know, was it hard to to make those changes when you when you saw something and you're like, oh, okay, I think I need to pivot this way? How did you handle that? So it, it seemed so easy from this end. Yeah, you know, it, it, you know it, was, it was pretty easy, but the way you know, like I, I always say, like all the good ideas I've had have come from talking and interacting with other people. Uh, like when I made that big pivot to the website, my idea. I walked into, I was talking to Mo at Texas Road History. We were going over things and we were doing business. He was one of the restaurants. And he's like, hey, can you build me my own online order website? It was an idea. <laughs> you know? And I was just like, that's an idea. I was like, yeah, I can do that. And, uh, and I did it. And that's how the business started. But that doesn't happen if I'm sitting in the office. You know, it, it all comes from just engaging with people. And, and it, so, like, a lot, all of my pivots were just natural. The, the pivot of Merrill Lynch from the coop on to the to the bit to the business I set up with Merrill Lynch, I went in selling a coupon book, and I came out with a different product, you know, uh, because she's like, I'm not interested in that, but we can work. And that, again, was not really my idea. It just came from engaging with people, you know. So I'd like to claim your spot. Club creativeness and cleverness, but really it's just all about kind of getting out there, you know. <laughs> yes. So that brings me to my next question, because we're in times now where we're limited with our face-to-face -face interaction. Our face-to-face -face interaction is different. It's now over video or, or back to the phones. So how do you conduct a business now and how are you growing given the new circumstances that we're under? Oh, good question. So uh, we completely pivoted and we're, we're, we're seeing really explosive growth right now. Um, and what in the past, and we still do this, things are opening up now, but we're partners with Restaurant Depot, which is like a, a Costco for restaurants. And we, in, in, in the past, we set up demo tables at checkout, uh, stores throughout the Northeast. And we really, every time we set up a table, we get 10 leads. Out of those 10 leads, we get an account. And so it's just a regular pipeline of business for us. We can't do that now. Or we're starting to be able to do that again. So that pipeline disappeared with, with COVID-19. Uh, fortunately, online ordering went up uh, because restaurants are closed and many clients that did dine-in business or pivoting to online ordering. So our income went up. So what I did was I hired a telemarketer. Another person on, I'm building, I built, I'm building in a, and, and build further an inside sales division. Uh, and so we have, we have people on the phones calling restaurants and we're trying to close deals on the phone and we're having some success. But we're teaming that up with my sales force. I have about 12 sales reps in the Northeast and, and in several pockets of the, of the country. So we're getting leads and then farming these out to the reps to go by in person and close deals. And uh, we're having a lot of success. It's, 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 we're still building the model. But, uh, you know, it's kind of thing. You make X number of calls. You get X number of appointments, 10 appointments you get one deal and uh, similar to the restaurant depot thing. So we're, we're pretty optimistic that this is going to be a good path forward, even when things get back to normal. Yes. I see a future where more online and takeout is going to be part of the norm and a limited 
um, sit down experience, let's say. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So that brings me to a question about empowerment. So you're empowering your, your sales force and you're also empowering the restaurants to take control of their situations and to embrace what's happening and how they can be successful and still have their restaurant business. Can you talk a little bit more about empowering and what that means to you? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so we just, uh, in terms of, um, <clears throat> we try to, um, we always tell our sales reps that it's, you know, you're not really selling what you want to do. It, you're really, you know, our restaurants are mostly mom and pop organizations. They're not Applebee's, they're not chains. They don't have C, uh, chief information technology offers. Many of them don't have branding. They're, they're just so caught up in the day-to-day -day, uh, operation of the restaurant. They know how to make a pizza. You know, many of them, don't, you know, they, have a, they have a lousy menu, you know. So what we try to do is educate them on how they can, you know, how like the yellow pages is really not important anymore. It's, it's all about being on Google. You should, you know, tell them that they should be checking their Google listing every week. Who's, you know, if they sign up for a company like Grubhub, Grubhub takes over their Google page, okay? So people get directed to Grubhub and not their website. So we try to really, you know, and then obviously we have a service that can help them. We do more than just the online ordering. We do social media for them. We do email marketing. And so we try really try to educate and empower our restaurants to, like, understand what's going on. And the population is getting younger. It's not people are, I mean, people our age are, are ordering still, but our kids don't pick up the phone anymore. They want to order online. What happens when you go to Google from your phone? What comes up? Does your restaurant come up? Or does a fake site from Grubhub come up with your name in the URL? And that happens all the time. So... We really try to educate our restaurant owners, plus my staff and our sales rep. And it's really about just just trying to, you know, to show them, you know, we just show them in person with your phone. This is what happens when I do a search. All these other companies come up, but not your website. So that's kind of what we try to do. Got it. And now that uh, you can't really see those people necessarily face to face are you also doing that education um like this over over a video chat sometimes most of our clients are really old school they're the kind of people that you send them an email it's an aol email address you know they, <laughs> their daughter checks it you know i mean so we do do some zoom meetings for for, for some people but a lot of it is just uh sending a detailed email with a link to their Google and to show them how it works. And then, and then now that, you know, things are opening up, we, we, we try to get in there and just and, and, and be there in person for them if, 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 if it's possible. Understood. It's, it's always like I, I look at your business and what you've done and it's like you're constantly morphing and changing and, yeah. and, and being flexible. Can you talk about some other characteristics that you think is um, enabling your success? Yeah, I think, um, you know, one of the, the, the things is uh, a couple of things. Um, one, I, I believe uh, someone gave me advice a long time. It's just about staying focused. You know, I, I can't tell you how many people have been like, oh, you should uh, do online or you should sell theater tickets or this and that. And like, there's so many ways you could branch out. But I've always really tried to, like, A, have goals, you know, and it's not a goal unless it's in writing. I remember when I was building my business and I started the website business with Texas Rotisserie, and my goal was 100 websites. You know? And I wrote it down and I looked at it every day and eventually I had 100 websites. So it's really focusing on goals, you know, and then just I, the other thing is just kind of, you know, it's really easy to get down when you're, you know, negative things that happen, you know, all the time with, with having your own business. 
And so it's really important to stay, to stay positive. Uh, and, uh, you know, just try to just keep, just keep along, you know, and, and, and you know, I, I remember when 9-11 happened, um, a quote by uh, Churchill, never, ever, ever give up. You know, that came out, and I just, that, that inspired me, you know, things like that, you know, it's just, just, just don't give up, you know, just, just, just keep plugging along. And, and, you know, and if you, if you put the time in, good things happen. And then the last thing is that nothing's easy. If you build your own business, you realize how hard it is and how long it takes. There's really no, in my opinion, there's, if it's too good to be true, it probably is. You know, if someone comes up with some scheme where you can make 50000 a month in six months, God, you know, just, it's, it, you just have to just, just, you know, plug along and eventually you get there, you know. Absolutely. And how do you personally stay positive besides these, these quotes that resonate with you? How do you stay positive? Um, I try to, uh, I, I get a lot of exercise. I try to, you know, if I'm if I'm at all stressed, I uh, I take a break and I, I I go for a mountain bike or I play tennis or I I play a lot of racket sports. I play squash, you know. I do. So uh, to me, that's a really good uh, way to relieve stress. And and I and I, and I just um, I'm, I'm fortunately I'm naturally a positive person. Um, so. You know, I don't get down too much, and I just really focus on what is good. And, and I think the most important thing is keep things in perspective. You know, you, you, there's always someone that has it worse than you. You know, some family's child has brain cancer, or someone who just loses their job, or, you know, <laughs> look at all the countries around the world where, you know, all the different world situations, even in our situation now, compared to what's happening in other parts of the world. So just, just keep things in perspective. You know, okay, I just lost my biggest client. It's not that big a deal, you know? I mean, you know I'll, get, I'll get it back, you know? And so that's kind of how I stay positive. Those are good suggestions, good ways of, yeah. uh, of, of coping. Yeah. So I hope that uh, motivates others and inspires others. Uh, if you had to go back in time, is there some piece of advice that you would give to your younger self? Um, hmm. Well, I guess uh, I, 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 um, I, st- I think I stayed with this paper job too long. Like I, I you know, and I also like I. I I got a late start, you know, to, like, I feel like I'm really oddly hitting my prime now. And uh, I feel that, you know, it would have been nicer to hit my prime in my mid forties, late thirties. I really spent a lot of my twenties basically partying in New York city and floating around on this dead end job. And I was bartending and then when I hit the, approached Merrill Lynch, I was working at Pete's Tavern, you know, and I think if I had, I had a little bit more focus uh, early on, I, I you know, I, I think I, I'm kind of a late bloomer, you know, I think that's one thing that, you know, sticks out a little bit, but once, once I really got on track, I feel, um, I don't have too many regrets in the last 15, 15 or so years, I mean, I'm sure there's things I could have done better, and I, and the thing is, you know, I, I've made so many mistakes with my business, you know, just running it myself and, you know, lack of branding. For example, my, my company uh, recently changed the name to Quick Chow. You know, that, that's something, you know, it's so much better than EDC Meals, Executive Dining Club. So that's something that, you know, I regret that actually. I mean, I should have done that 15 years ago, you know. Um, so little things like that in the business that they're, but when you run your own business, you know, it's a lot harder. You know, you don't have people, you don't have a board of directors, you don't have a staff to bounce ideas off of. So, you know, but I didn't have that made, much, much choice. I didn't have the money to hire other people. Uh, and so, you know, I, I really don't have too many regrets. That's good advice about focus and what you had learned all the, along the way with respect to 
branding. But as you were speaking, I thought of another question, which is around, you know, were there any mentors or advocates for you along the way, along your journey in entrepreneurship? Um, yeah, I would say that my father and both my brothers um, are people that I've always relied on. And all three of them, my dad had his own company in Long Island with, you know, couple hundred employees that he started himself. And uh, I worked for him one summer and that was, that was kind of defining, um, you know, seeing uh, how he interacted in the office and how much, how much respect he all gave to all his employees and how much they really liked him and, and the positive office environment and just what kind of big company he had built. You know, that kind of inspired me to go down that same road. And then both my brothers are successful entrepreneurs that have done very well uh, starting their own businesses. And, um, and I've always uh, used them uh, for advice. And, and really, uh, I'd say just it's really mostly within my family. And my grandfather also had, you know, we, have a, we come from a long line of uh, businessmen, basically. And, and uh, my sister, my little sister, has a very successful coaching uh, practice and and now and more recently I've been talking to her about what she's doing and she's been giving me advice uh, and and vice versa you know and she's more well versed in social media and so she's helping me with that and uh, you know so yeah it's really just within my family for the most part. That's so cool to have a, a built in and. Um think tank, if you will, of, yeah. of, of folks who have been in business for themselves and uh, know that mentality, that journey, that struggle that you mm -hmm. could all share together. Yeah. So before we wrap up, what would you like people to remember about our conversation today? Um, yeah, just stay focused. If you want to go down the road that I've gone down, it's really just stay focused. Don't give up, you know, and, uh, you know, just keep, keep plugging away. And, uh, you know, if you, if you put the time in, I really don't think there's shortcuts, you know. If you put the time in and uh, get out there and talk, you know, don't be afraid to change, evolve your product. And, uh, you know, and, and, and I, my, I've kept it lean, which is one of the reasons I, you know, I'm, I'm, we're, we're a very successful, profitable business, but, I know, you know, it's, uh, you know, I've always, always provide for my family and, and you know, I, I've never been over leveraged, you know. So, you know, yeah, that, that, that's really the advice I would uh, give a young entrepreneurs starting out. <laughs> oh, I'm going to repeat it because it's really great information. So stay focused. Don't give up. Put in the time and effort. Develop relationships with people evolve your product and service over time as circumstances might change and to to keep things lean and be resourceful right you you've looked within your family for some outside yeah. guidance and and perspective absolutely so john how can people find you because i want people to find you sure sure it's really simple you just go to quickchow.com let me spell it because there's no c in quick it's uh, Uh and there's a video on the, on the site that it summarizes our business, and uh, you can just go right to that website. And my cell phone number, which you know, I'm a hands-on uh, entrepreneur, is 917-796-7110. So anyone seen this video, if you uh, have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. I'm... I always pick my cell up. If I don't pick it up, leave me a message and I'll call you back. I have it on me all the time, Saturday, Sundays, not just five days. So I'll repeat that. So that's quickchow.com, Q U I K, no C, C H O W, one word, dot com. And to reach Don directly, it's 917 796 7110. I want to thank you so much, John, for 
being on the show today and for sharing your journey with us and how you've evolved over time and uh, stayed focused so that you can be successful. And to our viewers, I look forward to the next conversation with you.